I'm Chris Lattish, Dean of the College of Health and Human Sciences, and I am so pleased and so excited to welcome you to our celebration and formal launch of our public, uh, public health graduate program. This is a dream come true for us, and today the College of Health and Human Sciences reaches an important milestone in its young history. Our mission through our teaching, our research, and our engagement activities is to improve the health and well-being of people. We knew early in our history of our college that a world-class public health program should be a part of our research and degree program portfolio. Not only for the profound impact it can and it will have on human health, but also for the professional opportunities it will afford our students. We've built this program carefully and I hope over time you will judge skillfully. We studied how the very best have done it, like Johns Hopkins. And we've studied how the younger successful programs have done it, like Oregon State University. Dean Bray, welcome, and thank you for your help. We hope and we aspire to be equally as good. It's taken a team to do this. The Master of Public Health degree, the first of what we hope will be a portfolio of public health degree options, is uniquely designed as a college-based degree. That is unique. Faculty from all nine of our departments are part of the team, as well as departments and other colleges across campus. Our first direct partner in this endeavor is the Department of Statistics, and you'll hear more about that from the head of statistics in just a moment. Other important partnerships are to come. We will welcome, we hope, the Department of Entomology in the College of Agriculture, and the, and the school, the college, excuse me, of veterinary medicine. We also very much appreciate the support of our board, a brand new 10-member advisory board which met for the first time today. They will be introduced to you in a few moments as well. When I first started talking about public health and the possibility of launching a public health graduate program, I had to explain what pro health, public health professionals did. No more. With the emergence and the spread of Ebola in Africa, the recent debate in California over the vaccination of children against measles, and sadly, closer to home, the HIV outbreak in southern Indiana, we vividly understand the critical role of public health professionals and the importance in our lives. And that's the thrill of it. Research that promises to make the world a healthier place and the education of students who have a passion to do just that. We're proud to be star a strong part of President Daniel's broad goal to create meaningful learning opportunities for our students and to prepare them exceptionally well for those opportunities. We genuinely appreciate the support of both Provost Detta and President Daniels. Mitch is here to celebrate with us today. Given the frequent Mitch sightings at the COREC, our students know firsthand of his passion for fitness and for health. Professionally, he is well-connected and informed about health and healthcare delivery as he serves on the board of the Cerner Health Ventures and is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations Task Force on Non-Communicable Diseases. Since becoming our president in 2013, he has established himself as a thought leader in higher education. This week he was named as a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences Commission on the Future of Undergraduate Students. We are extraordinarily pleased and honored to have President Daniels today. Would you all please join me in welcoming him? Thank you so much, Chris, or her deanship, as I usually call her. Uh, this must be a big deal. <laughs> this must be a big damn deal. And, and uh, I, I, have, there's several, I know this for several reasons. One of them is, um, first of all, Richard, Dr. Richard Mattis wasn't at the gym uh, an, hour, <laughs> an hour and a half ago. We, we have lockers in the same little quarter, so I can testify. You know, he's, he's a role model. He's over there. Uh, uh, frequently, uh, you know, I alternate off, but it's, it, it, uh, Rick will do a bi biathlon. He'll, you know, run and swim on the same day. Uh, so, and then uh, uh, in a coat and tie too, you know, <laughs> that's another indicator. And then the guest list, welcome uh, to so many uh, uh, prestigious people who've come from other places. I, a special welcome to my old friend, Dr. Judy Monroe, who's down there somewhere. Um, uh, 
a lot of reasons to clap for, for Judy, but uh, she was happily, successfully, uh, fruitfully leading the family practice group at the whole St. Vincent system a few years ago. And, and uh, someone who really wanted to upgrade the quality of government across uh, Indiana tricked her into something she never expected to do. And she became commissioner of health for five years. And then, to my uh, great disgruntlement, she did such a darn good job, the CDC came and stole her away. But thank you, Judy, you were, for all you're contributing now at the, and have now for several years at the national level. Uh, let me state a couple of obvious things. I state them because they're well known in this room, but uh, unfor uh, unfortunately not by all our fellow citizens. And that is that uh, it, it remains, I think, the case that uh, public health is dramatically underappreciated for the incredible uh, importance that it has and gains that it has brought. Um, more, the, I don't know why, the glamour and publicity tends to attach to uh, uh, the latest uh, medical uh, or scientific breakthrough or potential breakthrough. Many of them don't pan out. What everyone in this room knows is that the enormous gains in life expectancy in this country and in the whole world. Um, gain, we have seen gains in the last 150 or 60 years that uh, go far beyond everything that happened in human history up to that time. And it really wasn't, except in a relatively small way in the relatively recent past, it really wasn't medical science that did it. In fact, uh, with apologies to all the doctors in the room, it's only been about a century that you weren't killing more people than you were saving. <laughs> um, but it was, it was public health, sanitation, and education that, that lifted, it gave un, innumerable life years to this world of, of, uh, live, uh, of productive lives, uh, lives that made all the rest of us wealthier and happier and of course the uh, the joy that was uh, that was uh, made possible in all those individual cases and so um, today's a day to remind ourselves and we get a chance to remind our friends and neighbors of the invaluable work that our public health professionals do and the other thought that came to mind as I reflected on this event was that sad to say there remains an incredibly urgent uh, need even in this country. And I, I suppose that can be viewed as a great opportunity um, uh, and should be, but um, isn't it uh, the sad case? I, I, I sometimes uh, say to people that, especially in the United States, our, in our medical system, we have the best body shops in the world, but nobody takes driver's ed. <laughs> so everybody crashes and then goes, you know, to the, you get great care often for things that, you shouldn't have, that shouldn't have happened to you in the first place uh, because you didn't uh, practice any kind of preventive uh, care. You, you, didn't, you didn't practice even basic uh, wellness and so forth. And so they're just huge opportunities. And yet it's, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, Judy will remember, I sure do. Um, early, early in, in, in my last job, we, uh, with great fanfare at the, uh, uh, more or less the co-rec of Indianapolis down at the, uh, the, the big uh, National Institute of Fitness and Sports, we had an announcement uh, of our In Shape Indiana program, which we ran for eight years, a, an attempt to get uh, as many people and bring as many resources to bear on the, on the challenges of, of uh, uh, getting more Hoosiers to uh, take the basic measures of preventive health, exercise, better diet, and all of that. And we had celebrities and sports figures and, you know, all the uh, media were there. And I remember saying on that day, of all the things we try to do, of all the initiatives we try to launch to make this state a better place, this one will be the least, as they say, controversial. Nobody's going to say this is a bad idea, but it'll also be the hardest, and it was. It is so hard to move the needle, uh, to get people to 
change the embedded habits of a lifetime. And we've developed some bad habits in this country. So um, uh, who was not, I suppose you weren't, most of us were stunned at least initially by the report just two or three days ago that life expectancy for whites is dropping in this country in the middle age groups. That's not supposed to happen in the richest country in the history of humankind. It's just testimony, uh, I believe, also to the, uh, the, the, the need for uh, more progress, more students, more great careers in, in public health and related fields. Judy, I, I remember at the same, uh, in, in, the, in the very next year, we went and got uh, um, folks to raise the tobacco tax in part to bring health insurance to more people, but also in part to close what appeared to be a gap in the, in the amount of vaccine available. And we were going to drive down to zero the number of kids who didn't have their proper immunizations. And it didn't happen. Oh, well, it came down, but it turned out that when you, you can have all the vaccine in the world, but too many people didn't understand the imperative need to see that every child was protected. So these these things are hard, and yet the payoff, of course, for society is so so good. You know, lastly, the uh, the, the challenge. My my new friends, uh, Danelle and Paige and Ola and Aaron and this this group here, the first crop, who uh, will will uh, emerge from this wonderful program. Uh, I'm so excited for you, but but also a little daunted about the the difficulty of the work that you'll have to uh, undertake. Um, uh, at a time when uh, family structure continues to erode badly in all areas, all sectors of society, uh, the uh, uh, sad to say, but public health professionals will have to fill in gaps in many, many young lives that fill in with education and learning that could have happened and once would have happened in a home. So, um, lastly, um, although we do have uh, ironically, these very big challenges facing us in this country, it is a global issue. I, I was conscripted into this uh, uh, one commission, co-chairing this commission on non-communicable diseases. I learned so much doing that. It is an enormous rising problem across the world. Uh, uh, every bit as urgent in its way as the infectious diseases we tend to think of first when we think of less developed countries. And so the careers that are ahead of you after you've been prepared by this exceptional and carefully thought out program um, uh, are, are going to be noble ones and thrilling ones and may take you uh, literally across the world and I hope they do. So to everybody who brought this into uh, uh, being, congratulations. It, it was careful and deliberate. It took a while, didn't it, Chris? But it's here. And they're here. And uh, so from now on, full speed ahead. Congratulations. OK. Thank you, President Daniels. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for, uh, for coming. We already viewed you as family and uh, partners in, in this endeavor. Uh, we have a packed program, and we're already a bit behind on it. So uh, let me just give you an, uh, an overview of the symposium. Uh, we're not going to break in between each speaker. We won't be taking questions. Uh, and I won't be introducing each one uh, because that'll just be a waste of time. You have their names, and you have their affiliations uh, uh, already in the program. Uh, so basically, the, the way we've structured the, the symposium is uh, we're going to start off with a history of uh, the public health uh, field and then uh, move into uh, the national picture as it, as it currently exists. Uh, I'll then um, talk a little bit more about health issues in the state of Indiana and uh, our program specifically. That will be followed by three presentations from faculty that are uh, centered in each of our concentration areas, which we'll be describing for you shortly. And lastly, uh, we're going to have a bit of a parade 
um, of the six cluster hire faculty that, that were brought on board uh, to jumpstart this program uh, a few years ago. Really, really, they're just going to come up. They've been told they get one slide, two minutes. Uh, we, we just want you to see their face, put a name and, and, a, uh, uh, and a face and an area of research together, and then we're going to have a reception afterwards, and that'll be your opportunity to go up and visit with them and, and learn more about uh, what they have to offer. So uh, let me begin, and uh, I'll just introduce uh, Wendy Klein, who uh, holds a chair in the history department, and then she's going to talk about the history of public health. forward, back, and point. Okay. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's an exciting day. I'm going to start my timer, make sure, because I love to talk. Um, and when Rick approached me and asked me if I would talk, uh, uh, give a history of public health in 15 minutes, I said, Rick, 15 minutes? I can do it in 14. No problem. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. Um, it's a rich, complex, and important history, and hopefully all I can do today is um, make a, say a few words, but hopefully I will entice some of you to um, either encourage or actually take my new history of public health course that will start being regularly offered next year. So I'm going to just talk about three main points. Uh, the, the first is about the the uh, dominant paradigm of the outbreak narrative, which I'll explain, then a couple of successes historically, and then I'll end with a few challenges as well. But throughout, my main em emphasis, not surprisingly as a historian, is that history matters. We cannot adequately approach the challenges of public health today without understanding its relationship to the past. It's far more than names or dates or memorizing or a simple story of progress. Um, it's much more rich and complex. So like any good historian, I'll start in the present. This is a photograph of my daughter last weekend for Halloween. Um, and does anybody know what costume she's wearing? She's a zombie bride. Um, this is not the kind of costume I grew up wearing. I tended to be little at Red Riding Hood, maybe a Crayola crayon, maybe a bride, but certainly not a zombie bride. But my daughter isn't some kind of freak. Zombies are hip. Zombies are in. So why? What is the obsession with zombies? Part of it has to do with one of my, the favorite uh, shows of my children, The Walking Dead and the zombie apocalypse. And what fascinates about me about this is that this is really a story of plague. The stories in The Walking Dead uh, typically follow a single group of survivors caught up in the sudden rush of the crisis. And the narrative generally progresses from the onset of the zombie plague, then initial attempts to seek the aid of authorities, the failure of those authorities, through to the sudden catastrophic collapse of all large-scale organization and the characters' subsequent attempts to survive on their own. So, as my daughter donned her mythical costume this Halloween, I went outside and retrieved my two daily newspapers, the Journal and Carrier and the uh, New York Times. And one look at them and their main headlines served as a reminder that Halloween nightmares were not just fantasies. Ideas and images that we see as far removed from us in reality as zombies can return reside or lay dormant in our own backyard. So case in point, the cover story in the Journal and Courier had to do with a syphilis outbreak, 12 reports in Tippecanoe County compared to less than five reports in each of the last four years. And statewide Indiana is following the same trend. More than 350 cases were reported this year, representing a 53% increase from last year. The other case you can't see very well, uh, but it's the New York Times. Uh, the, the cover story is uh, white families seek a gentler war on heroin, talking about the changing face of addiction and overdose. And as we know, it's moving closer and closer um, to the Midwest. As Tippecanoe County, back to the syphilis, as Tippecanoe County Health Officer Jeremy Adler says, syphilis is often viewed as a disease that happened a long time ago that was a problem in the old days. 
clearly this shows that it can still be a problem and it's something that we have to really be aware of and educate the public about. It's a preventable, curable disease. Why, if our focus is on cure, is this still a public health problem? As public health historian John Duffy points out, one of the more obvious lessons from public health history is that knowing how to prevent a disease does not necessarily lead to its control or elimination. Other factors obviously contribute to the problem. And sometimes, ironically, it can be the same technology that used to improve public health, health outcomes. And I'll just point out the, um, the subtitle in the, in, the, in the cover story, Spike and Syphilis, is the question, is the dating app to blame? Can somehow, can we uh, blame technology for actually being part of the problem? Another factor is fear. Um, and so I want to talk briefly about the, the idea of the outbreak narrative, um, which can help us make sense of, to our reactions to infectious diseases, and has really become the primary lens through which we perceive disease threats. And it goes like this. Globalization has shrunk the world, rendering all of us vulnerable to hidden dangers lurking everywhere. Those unlike us, often stigmatized by race or class, endanger us as disease carriers. Germs, portrayed as beings with a conscious purpose, invade our country and our bodies like alien armies or like zombies. Disease detectives persevere through daunting obstacles aided by cutting edge technology and eventually save the day. The heroes of the story are usually doctors or scientists and its scapegoated villains are most often the victims of disease themselves who through simple carelessness or exotic cultural practices contribute to an outbreak spread. Now as a result of the perpetuation of this outbreak narrative, our fears are not actually grounded in reality, nor do they really help us protect ourselves and our communities. And I want to show you a very quick great example of this. This is um, a the findings of a Google News search from one day, October 22nd, 2014, about a year ago, about the number of hits um, on Google. Malaria, 98,000 hits. Heart disease, 126,000. AIDS, 524,000. Ebola, 28.1 million Google hits on that day. So out of curiosity, I thought, well, what is this? What's the relationship between the number of hits and the actual likelihood that you're going to be um, affected directly by this? Malaria, 2014, 584,000 deaths, 198 million cases. Heart disease, just in, this, in the United States alone, 610 deaths, 1,000, 610,000 deaths. AIDS, uh, 1.5 million AIDS-related deaths uh, worldwide. Ebola, 11,314 in the US, two. Clearly, the, the correlation between these two is questionable. We shouldn't be surprised, though. Ebola presses all of the, the buttons in the outbreak narrative. It's unfamiliar. It comes from an exotic place. It is incurable and often fatal. It's the stuff of horror movies. But and especially when the fear that it's actually coming close to the United States, as we all witnessed a year ago. But it's not new. Uh, historically, the fear of the unknown has always received the most uh, focus. It's inexplicable and it's foreign. And we see the same pattern over and over again. So the case in point I'll briefly touch on is the yellow fever era. This is between, there were several, but the one I'm referring to is between 1793 and 1806 in the United States. Now, like Ebola, yellow fever was another of the viral hemorrhagic fevers that wreaked such terrifying havoc on the body's internal organs. Yellow fever was also known colloquially by, most, by its most distinctive symptom, and that is black vomit, which occurred when large quantities of blood ac accumulated in the stomach. Its ravages in Philadelphia and other seaport cities constituted a serious national crisis when it broke out in 1793. Now, at that point, yellow fever was no stranger to America. Its terrible attacks uh, had begun in the 1690s, but there'd been about a 30-year gap since the last outbreak of yellow fever in the, United, in the colonies. 
And it had gradually tapered off by the mid-18th century and then disappeared. So what does that mean? In the meantime, an entire generation has grown up with absolutely no experience of this deadly disease. So when it returned mysteriously in 1793 in Philadelphia, it aroused terror. 10% of the population of Philadelphia died, 5,000 people. And between 1793 and 1806, it hit every port city and town on the East Coast and ranged as far as New Orleans on the Gulf Coast. It shocked the entire nation. As news spread of its first arrival in Philadelphia, quarantine measures in every town and state were put into place. Baltimore called out the militia to guard the roads against sick refugees from Philadelphia. Now, this is just a quick example, um, but I, I intentionally brought up the term quarantine. Um, and if we look historically, sorry, the, the images are very small, but I wanted to just give you a, a snapshot um, to suggest that uh, the context can change, but it, the, the terrifying issues remain. The politics um, of quarantine has obviously a very, very long history, well before the 1790s, and each has its own story of violence, terror, tragedy, and sometimes success. But we can't d discount the role of power in politics, whether it's uh, yellow fever riots in Staten Island in 1858, or the bubonic plague in San Francisco's Chinatown in 1900, where they're behind bar barbed wire in this photograph, or um, the Ebola quarantine of West Point community in Monrovia in 2014. Each one, of course, is a rich and important story, but we can see some patterns here. Now, a lot has changed since the 1793 outbreak of yellow fever in Philadelphia, and much of it um, has, and, and throughout the United States, and much of it has a lot to be celebrated. So I'll briefly, secondly, touch on a few successes. Um, and, and, and major turning points. Many of you are familiar with these, so I'm, I'm really only going to take a minute for this. But um, the Civil War was one of these turning points for a number of reasons. One being it helped usher in the sanitary revolution. Um, and it was, the war itself was followed immediately by the appearance of the first effective municipal health departments and the beginnings of state boards of health. Um, I think it's hard, especially for, for young, for when I, my students, when, when I talk about the sanitary revolution, to visualize what life was like prior to the sanitary revolution, even in the United States. So, for example, here's a, a set of descriptions of the city around the turn of the century. This is an observer in Milwaukee in 1889 who claimed that um, garbage remained so long in the streets that it eventually attempted to remove itself by crawling away in the shape of active little worms. There too, dead animals, debris, and horse manure, compounded with the odors of the slaughter from slaughterhouses, must have been unbearable in summer and must have tested the nostrils of even the hardiest residents in the warm months. So we can't under, underestimate or underscore um, enough the importance of the sanitary revolution. But more than, than this in the 19th century, the nature of public health was undergoing fundamental changes. In the first place, medicine, on which public health practice is based, was in the throes of a major revolution. Advances in pathology, physiology, and chemistry, for example, were setting the stage for a bacteriological revolution, providing answers to many great and endemic um, and epidemic diseases. And of course, this is when we see the rise of the laboratory where most of the research begins to take place. By 1900, a, a good many pathogenic organisms had been identified. The role of insects and other vectors in the spread of disease had been discovered, and vaccines were appearing on large scale. And of course, the late 19th century also witnessed the rise of health professions and of specialization within them. Another indicator is the organization of the American Public Health Association in 1872, which clearly indicated the emergence of a new 
medical specialty. Now, Johns Hopkins has already been mentioned, but I'll just point out that as the field of public health became institutionalized and professionalized in the early 20th century, the need for specialized training became evident. How do you do that? You do that through education. In 1916, the Rockefeller Foundation gave $267,000 to establish the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. Hygiene meaning a place for basic research and public health reflecting the desire to promote practical training. Johns Hopkins really represented a compromise between the German concept of, research, of a research institute and the British system of providing practical training for its health work. And it becomes, of course, the dominant model. Um, and in October of 1919, Johns Hopkins officially opens, becoming the first permanent American school of public health in the United States. So we can celebrate that. Lastly, I want to talk, though, about challenges. And of course, I could go on about this, but um, Two, very briefly, two main themes um, are the constant alternation between apathy and sharp reaction to periodic health crises. And a good example of that is, um, comes from Dr. Bruce Aylward um, of the, uh, the, the World Health Organization in March of two, 2015 when he said, six months ago, the world was worried. There was a lot of self-interest in making sure this thing was stopped. And we know that from the 28 point whatever million Google hits that one day. Uh, the biggest mistake the world could do right now, he says, is blink. But that's what happens. We, we, we go back and forth between apathy and a sharp reaction. The second theme that we see frequently and that I love to teach in my classes is the clash between individual liberty and public welfare, which often do not match, right? Can we mandate vaccines for the public good? When is it okay to quarantine? Those kinds of really difficult questions that we're constantly confronted with. So that's all I'll say about those. The final challenge I want to talk about are internal. And by, I, I'll, I'll use the example of uh, the publication in 1988 from the Institute of Medicine, um, The Future of Public Health. The Institute of Medicine devoted an entire chapter in this 1988 study to the disarray of public health in which it cited the field's poor public image as an important facet of its contemporary disarray, as they said. Uh, interviews with public health workers across the United States suggested that most Americans did not understand or appreciate the importance of public health. Its services were either invisible, as in the case of clean water supplies or sewage control, or associated with stigmatized groups, such as the very poor or the dangerously ill. Public health efforts to reduce health risks through re legislation and regulation, such as seatbelt laws and anti-smoking codes, were resented as interference, interference with personal freedoms, while the necess necessity for disease surveillance often conflicted with cherished rights of personal privacy. So that leads me to my final, really last question, uh, which uh, has stymied the profession, and it's a very basic question. What is public health? How do we define it? The term is so familiar, as a public health historian, John Duffy, says, um, it's so familiar that we tend to assume its meaning is clearly understood, yet defining it has been a major preoccupation of public health leaders for the past hundred years or more. A good example of this comes back to Johns Hopkins. And um, during the debate about how the public school for public health would work, uh, the real challenge was a lack of agreement on what constituted public health and on which group of professionals should have the dominant voice in the field. The main clash was between physicians, who insisted that public health was purely medical, and sanitary engineers, who argued for a more uh, complex mod modal, model. So, um, in a recent publication, the clear definition that comes out is pu public health is typically distinguished from healthcare by its focus on the prevention of illness rather than on the cure, and its intervention at the level of populations rather than on individual patients. Well, that seems pretty clear, right? But the boundaries themselves have constantly are constantly being negotiating. 
uh, negotiated. And the changing definitions of public health uh, have been accompanied by comparable alterations in the public's perception of what even constitutes disease and ill health. That in, in and of itself changes quite a bit. At different moments in history, all of the following have been seen as legitimate forms of public health action. Housing reform, street cleaning and sanitation, mass education about nutrition, obesity, sexual intercourse, drug use, hospital and clinic care, curbs on handgun availability, and prevention and response to bioterrorism. So it's, it's a, a fluid um, and contested boundary. Uh, just to end, I'll, I'll show you two images back to the syphilis and the story in the front page of the journal and, and courier. Um, what you can see, uh, as the, general, the director general of the World Health Org Organization said after the recent Ebola outbreak, old diseases in new contexts will bring you surprises, whether it's the girl next door or the dating app on your phone that is somehow um, leading to a, a rise in syphilis. So the best thing we can do as scholars, as students, and as professionals is to keep in mind the varied context and meanings of disease and health over the course of history. And so I do ask that you do consider the past as we look to the future. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Pam Altonen. I'm a faculty member in the School of Nursing. And if you see me uh, walking around a bit later, my shoulders may be here a little bit higher uh, because I've just completed a year as the uh, chair of the American Public Health Associate Association Executive Board. So, uh, and I just got back yesterday after eight days of doing a lot of talking. So if my voice uh, breaks up, you'll know that I need to grab one of these 20 bottles of water that are in the... <laughs> the front of the, the, the space. So what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes talking to you about the status of uh, health in the, the nation, and then I'm going to talk about what I saw over the last eight days as, as a convergence of ideas about where we need to go in public health in the future. As our president already said, uh, we don't look uh, very good when we compare ourselves to other developing countries in terms of our life expectancy. Look at this. We rank 34th among developing uh, nations. And as he said, uh, we're at risk of uh, uh, the uh, trend going the, uh, the wrong uh, direction in terms of this. And we don't look very well in terms of other parameters of, of health. So even though we have uh, an expensive health care system, it has not translated well in terms of, of public health. If you look at this slide, it shows that we've had a, a relative decline in terms of uh, where we have ranked with uh, infant mortality. This happens to be with uh, females, but if I showed you the slide for males, it would be exactly the, the same. In the, in the 1980s, we were about in the middle of the pack. By 2009, we're at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, this is a serious call to us to think clearly about what we're doing in uh, public health. And we, as I said, don't look very good in terms of other uh, indicators of health as, as well. Uh, about the, the most positive piece of this particular slide is that uh, actually when you look at smoking, uh, we're doing better than uh, many of the other uh, developing uh, nations. But many data points for improvement. This slide I particularly like because this uh, combines uh, both the um, expense of health care as well as the expense of social care. And you'll see the United States in about the middle of the, the slide. But when you add those two components uh, together, uh, you'll notice, again, that we spend about as much as some of the other countries, but relatively more on health care and less on social care. I think this gives us an opportunity in public health uh, to really make a change in our, our country. So our challenges are, and, and I think uh, President Daniels and our, our history speaker, even uh, Wendy talked about these uh, as well, 
I listed them out as being uh, unhealthy diets, smoking, physical inactivity, air pollution or changes in the, the climate, alcohol and drug use. Again, we've heard some examples already of what's uh, been going on in that area. Uh, violence, health inequity, and I added information which may uh, initially seem a little odd on this list. And by information, I mean a number of things. I mean how we uh, take in information and add it together and spit it out in terms of having meaningful data that we can use in the healthcare system. I'm also speaking about the information that the, the many people that we work with in public health are gathering themselves through the internet uh, by getting tweets from their their friends uh, by uh, purchasing and using biosensors, and I think that's an area that's going to explode. So people are going to have all of this information, but what do they do with it? How do they interpret it? How does it uh, change them uh, in terms of their own uh, behaviors? A tremendously challenging area. Um, and again, public health on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, we know about risk associated with uh, behavior. Uh, with uh, changes in our environment, with uh, social determinants of health, uh, fertile ground for public health. And thanks to the work of Michael uh, Marmoth, Sir Michael Marmoth uh, from uh, England, uh, we know that we need to be looking at other measures of, of health care. One of the things he just said uh, earlier this week when I uh, was at breakfast with him was that uh, when we do a health profile of our community, we should have things like, what is the high school graduation rate of our, our community? It says a lot about the health status of our nation. And certainly then, if we look at the response, we have the, the government public health agencies, and, and again, uh, Wendy talked about a number of those in terms of their their uh, activities, uh, health and human services. Within health and human services, we have the Centers for Disease Control, and uh, Dr. Monroe is here, uh, and certainly available, I'm sure, afterwards to talk to you about uh, the exciting things that are happening at uh, CDC. Uh, HRSA funds uh, clinics in the state of uh, Indiana and elsewhere across the, the uh, country. The Indian Health Service, so all the, the federal organizations that are working with state and local uh, organizations to improve uh, the status of health. But I'd now really like to talk about uh, what's going on in terms of a national momentum. These are our four national organizations that are working in the arena of, of health uh, as non-governmental uh, organizations. And the f these are only four of, of many. Uh, I clearly, uh, and with some bias, uh, picked uh, the American Public Health Association as one that I wanted to talk about. We had 13,100 people in Chicago last week for the American uh, Public Health Association. It was exciting, and hopefully many of them came to our uh, booth that Purdue University had to recruit both students and, uh, and faculty. Uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the largest uh, uh, philanthropy uh, focused uh, solely on health. The Public Goods Project, which is using marketing uh, to address uh, health concerns of our, our country, and then the Rockefeller Foundation with their new uh, Lancet Commission on the Status of the Environment. So, American Public Health Association. Uh, a year ago, the American Public Health Association uh, put forward a different kind of strategic map that was focused outward rather than inward in the association. And what we said was that we want to create the healthiest nation in one generation. That's a, that's a pretty uh, large uh, goal. Uh, and this year we uh, started uh, one piece of that, if you see the three overlapping circles, which is to start a public health movement. And we've tagged the public health movement, movement Generation Public Health. And uh, at a, a break, I have some ribbons for you that you can uh, uh, take home and actually go to the APHA website and join Generation of Public Health because we want everyone to be a part of that. Now I need to see if I can actually get this. How am I going to get the video to go? This is a, a short uh, clip about uh, becoming a member of Generation Public Health.
So uh, please do go to the APHA w website and, and, uh, and do this. Now, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a, a similar uh, goal. Their goal is to create a culture of health. And clearly, APHA can't reach their goal if uh, the goal of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is also not, not reached. And you'll notice in, in uh, their work that they're talking about health being a shared value, that we all need to uh, share in that, that there should be cross-sector sector, uh, collaboration, again, something I think we're all uh, very well of, that we need uh, healthier and more equitable uh, communities, that we really need to be paying attention to the social determinants of health that have so much to do with our, our health status in, in public health, and also to strengthen the integration of uh, health services and, and systems, uh, something I know the uh, advisory committee was talking about earlier the, this, this morning. And the public goods uh, project, um, this is all focused on, on marketing, but they too have a goal of having uh, a healthier America. Um, and uh, Public Works is trying to make uh, messages that will educate a much larger community about the important messages of, of public health and to make this a, a thread in the fabric of our life. And the, uh, uh, Tom Foley, the head of uh, Public Works, shared uh, a little bit about their campaign about broccoli. So I, sh I thought I'd just share a couple of uh, pieces of, of this. This is called the, mock the Broccoli uh, Makeover to uh, reorganize, make us rethink a little bit about what we've been talking about as global health to become planetary health. Uh, that was a, a term that was uh, new to me uh, and introduced by the, uh, the foundation. But they're, they're thinking about and looking at how our degradation of our environment is uh, increasing our health risk and how we might have built our health gains in the past on uh, the, uh, the environment. So another area where we clearly need to all uh, be working together uh, to look at issues in, in public health. So how will we measure all of, all of these things? Uh, I know many in the room are, are very focused on evidence-based practice, so how will we know that we've arrived at the healthiest nation in one generation? And, and fortunately, uh, what was the uh, Institute of Medicine and is now the uh, National Academy of, of Medicine uh, has just come out with this book called uh, Vital Signs, and I would certainly uh, refer you to this uh, particular publication uh, because it, it does set out a number of metrics that we can use in, in public health and, and to help us uh, consider what we need to be doing in terms of our uh, activities. So, in conclusion, I see this as a very pivotal time for, for public health. We could not be launching our public health program at a, at a better time in history in terms of how many opportunities there are for, for us as, as researchers and teachers and students and practitioners as we, we put all of these uh, pieces together. Uh, we need to seize the moment, and this would be my a little call to action that uh, everyone in this room can be a part of moving uh, public health forward. Thank you. Okay, I'll continue the journey then from uh, the, the national scene to uh, the state of Indiana, and then uh, focus a little bit more on our program and, and what we're starting here. Uh, so uh, start off with um, the depressing news and, and a continuation of uh, what Pam had shown on the national level, unfortunately also applies to our state. In fact, in, in some instances is even worse here than, than on the national average, the uh, national scene. So this is a, a trend line in a global measure of health of uh, residents in Indiana. And unfortunately, you can see that it has a downward slope to it over the last uh, uh, half century. Uh, there is one, one blip here, one reversal of trend that just so happens to correspond to when Judy Monroe was the state health commissioner. And, uh, <laughs> And, and I will re reiterate uh, Mitch's comment that it was a great loss when we lost her to CDC. But, but uh, hopefully the same blip will occur on the national scene with her, her role there. 
Uh, but the, the point here is that uh, we have been on a downward trend and actually rank 41st out of 50 states in, in global health measures. Now, how is that? Uh, what are the metrics for that? How do you measure that? Uh, there are different sites that, that take different tax. I, I just happened to pick uh, one here that has a composite of, of public health issues that they work together into an equation that, that comes out with a number that allows us to rank states. The larger the circle, the heavier the weighting is in the equation. And red circles are where you're below the national average. Green is where you're above the national average. And so this is the state of Indiana. And, and what you can see, unfortunately, is the big circles are all colored red. Right? So we have serious problems with obesity. Uh, low levels of physical activity, high incidence of diabetes, smoking is a real problem in this state, air pollution is, is, is a major issue. So you put them all together and uh, you understand why we're ranked 41st. And, and just to put some numbers on, on some of those circles, so obesity, we rank 42nd in the nation. Smoking, 39th. You can see we hover around 40 or so on, on all of these important indices. 39 for diabetes, air pollution, we're almost dead last in the nation. Uh, infant mortality, my gosh, how can, how can we uh, even sleep at night knowing that we're 39th uh, in this realm? So, uh, clearly, we must do something about this. And, and as Wendy pointed out, there are successes in public health. Indeed, one, one statistic uh, that, that she didn't mention, actually Mitch uh, alluded to it at the beginning, uh, CDC estimated that the increased uh, life expectancy over the last 100 or so years of about 30 years of life, 24 and a half of those or so is attributable to public health, only just over four of those to medical practice. So public health, if we want to make an impact, this, this is a place to do it. And addressing chronic disease may be the new frontier that, that allows us uh, to take that on. Uh, the problem is, the question is, do we have uh, the will, the resources, and the talent to pull this off? And my, my reluctant conclusion is, at this moment, uh, it's not clear that we do. Uh, oops, wrong, no, uh, uh, wrong direction there. Yeah, um, we don't. Well, uh, actually, the, the the point I wanted to make with this slide is that in terms of resources, I showed you the statistics on on health outcomes, but in terms of resources, we also rank 47th out of 50 in terms of federal funding for healthcare, uh, and. Uh, I don't think it's a matter of this state just has poor grant writers. Uh, uh, in fact, if you uh, also look uh, at the um, support, for example, in federal aid uh, for disaster relief, we're in the upper few percentiles uh, nationally for that. So it's a matter of priorities. It's a matter of education. It's a matter of active uh, activity in, in generating the will to, to address these problems. So I know this looks like a Stephen Covey kind of quote. In fact, it wasn't him. Um, uh, and the best I can do in terms of an attribution of she said, he said. Uh, but, that, but, but I think it's a, a quote that, that rings true, that change happens at the speed of trust. And, and that is what we have in abundance here at Purdue and in, uh, on campus and in particular in the College of Health and Human Sciences. And uh, so what I'd like to do is sort of whiz through the, the changes that have occurred on campus that have led us up to this moment in terms of launching uh, this program. So first, uh, going back to 2006, that is when public health actually became a program on campus. It was housed in the Department of Health and Kinesiology, and several faculty there took the initiative uh, to begin the program and, and did a very laudable job. In 2007, they enrolled their, their first class, and, uh, and the, the project started. 2010, uh, we uh, launched the new College of Health and Human Sciences. Dean Laddish became our leader. And uh, after running through an exercise of strategic planning, 
uh, and consultation with department heads, uh, the dean decided this is a place we can make a mark. This is a place I'm going to commit resources. We're going to, uh, we're going to grow this, this program. And one of the first activities was to launch a cluster hire uh, to jumpstart the process and bring in uh, a critical mass of bright young talent uh, to, to set uh, uh, an agenda and, and begin to work in this area. So that brings us up kind of to the, to the modern uh, time. In 2014, uh, the, the program, I guess you could say, officially started July. Uh, we had uh, somebody agreed to take uh, the lead on it. And uh, in September, we had already identified our concentrations. And, and in doing that, we looked around campus and said, where are we really strong already? How can we tap existing resources? Uh, and so we identified concentrations, which I'll identify in just a moment. Uh, next month in November, the college, uh, uh, the uh, public health program was moved out of the Department of Health and Kinesiology, where, where it had a fine incubation period, but it was then uh, uh, moved as a college level program in, in HHS. And the official move happened in November. In 2015 then, January, we hired our uh, public health coordinator, uh, Shauna Stapleton, who I think almost everybody in this room has already met and is already in awe of uh, for the things that uh, she's already accomplished. Uh, and then in February, uh, we started to receive the first applications for the program. You know, we had students that were enrolled in the previous program. We had an obligation to see them through. Uh, and so uh, we had to launch this program without skipping a beat in, in terms of training our students and, and keeping the progress going. So uh, we, we started uh, advertising and, and recruiting new students. Actually, we didn't do much advertising. They heard about us and started pouring in, uh, which I think uh, says something about pent-up demand. Uh, by May, we had identified um, a, and just incredible uh, set of... Uh, distinguished scholars and, and, and community organizers and healthcare workers uh, to serve as our external advisory committee. We were determined to have expertise representation from government, from industry, from academia, from the healthcare system, uh, from the community, uh, and, and with that combination of expertise, we were pretty sure we'd get the best possible guidance. And, and you can see the individuals. We when we set this out, when we set our agenda, we, we of course had our first choice, and we got our first choice, and every single one of these individuals, there was only one person that, that uh, deferred, and we found out they deferred because they decided to join the faculty at um, in the School of Public Health in Bloomington. So, uh, <laughs> at least they're in the state, and we, and we picked right on that. But uh, uh, we have just a tremendous board, and we met with them just prior to this symposium and already have given us uh, great guidance on, on how to move uh, the next steps. Okay, in uh, 2015, June, uh, we uh, had that cluster hire group coalesce, and uh, they received their first external grant and have already planned a symposium for April. Uh, where they will discuss the topic of public health and technology. Uh, the, the university has used this mechanism of, of cluster hires to jumpstart areas in, in different places on campus. It's a wonderful idea. Uh, it's had varying levels of success, but we have no doubt that ours is going to be a success. They have already bonded. They, I, I'm on their email chatter, and they are an active group and, and going to be a force on campus. Um, we had uh, all of our concentrations approved by the graduate school by July. In August, um, uh, we had all of our tracks, ways to admit students uh, to the program ad approved by the graduate school. So we had the structure in place. Uh, and in August, we took on our inaugural class. We have 25 students that uh, are in the first class. Eight were carryovers from the previous program, though they have uh, adapted, adopted the new curriculum, and uh, we've uh, admitted 15 new uh, students already. And uh, just 
last week. Uh, we found out that our application uh, for accreditation was approved. That doesn't mean we're, acc we're accredited. It means our application to go through the process to get accredited was approved, which may sound like, uh, well, what's the big deal? Who's not going to approve an application? But believe me, it's a process just to get your application approved, and we were successful at that. So our clock is ticking, and, um, uh, and we, are, we are launched and, and moving forward. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea of uh, the nature of the program, uh, by, uh, uh, as determined by the Council uh, for Education and Public Health, uh, that's the credentialing body uh, for public health programs, uh, we have a 42 credit hour uh, program and it addresses the core areas of public health. Every program that's accredited in the nation uh, addresses these areas, we do as well. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, identified uh, three different concentration areas and students take 15 credit hours in, in a chosen concentration. They have a few electives and they all have to do a practicum, a 400 hour uh, community engagement activity to really get hands-on experience. So they leave the program ready to hit the road and, and be productive. We have, uh, this number is wrong already. Um, uh, something actually now at this point probably 50 or, or more faculty. We, we just started a new dialogue with the uh, Department of uh, uh, Anthropology. We couldn't be more excited about working with them. They've got a department head that's supportive of us. Of us. They have new faculty hires that are working in this realm. It's going to be a solid new, new uh, avenue for us. Uh, they represent a wide swatch of, of departments on campus. Uh, the dean mentioned we have everybody in health and human sciences on board, uh, but we're reaching out across campus. The ones in red are ones where we already have formal ties with. The graduate program has already recognized um, that, that we're working with them. The ones in black are, are yet to come. And, and there may be new ones as well. I, at the APHA meeting, I was encouraged by a number of people to reach out to pharmacy. And, uh, what better positioning than to have all these people out in the community they can spread the, spread the word. So, um, our concentrations uh, are uh, listed here and we picked them, as I say, because we already had tremendous strength on campus in, in each of these areas and they're all vital areas in, in the grand scheme of, uh, of public health. You know, we have a whole department, human development and family studies. We have the world-class uh, uh, extension service that have representatives in every, every county in, in the state. Uh, we have the Military Family and Research Institute. We have so much going on in, in this area. So we're going to harness all that for public health. Uh, we have a very, very strong program in health sciences. We have a new department in engineering, uh, environmental and ecological engineering obvious partners there, so we'll pull that together to address this area. And then we have strong support by the statistics department uh, as well, and we are going to feed them data set after data set after data set so they can do their magic on the numbers uh, and help us address problems in a systematic way. Uh, in order to, to service the community, uh, uh, we have set up and already have approved uh, all these different tracks to, to recruit students to the program. We have combined degree option. That's an accelerated master's program, so undergraduate students can apply uh, in their sophomore year and in just one addition, if they plan things appropriately, uh, in just one additional year after completing their bachelor's, they can leave Purdue with a master's. Um, we have traditional standalone for people who already have a bachelor's that want to come and do the two-year program, and uh, very exciting, we also have a dual degree option, so students that are already admitted to graduate programs on campus and decide they want to get additional training in public health so they can leave with the dual degree, um, uh, we have the option uh, for uh, facilitating that, and the way we think we can work it out, again, with proper counseling, uh, it should only take about an extra semester for them to be able to leave with a PhD in whatever their STEM area is and uh, a degree in public health. What a perfect professional in this era where everything is, uh, uh, all the talk in science is about translation, right? Taking basic knowledge and turning it into practical use in the community and for the population's good. Those are the professionals that are really going to be able to move the needle. 
So how are we going to distinguish ourselves from all the other programs on, uh, in, in the nation and, and within our state? We do have two schools of public health and state and some other smaller programs. Uh, I think we do it by, again, drawing on Purdue's reputation and strength, right? We are analytical, we are science driven, we are technology. Uh, we have that reputation, and it is a terrific reputation. I can't tell you how many people came up to our table at the APHA meeting just to say, oh, Purdue's in, in the program now. This is great. And I'm an alum, and I'm so proud to be uh, an alum of this college. We have a huge halo already that has given us credibility um, in, in this sphere. But the scientific rigor is, is I think, where we can really make uh, a, a unique contribution to the field. So many programs have defined curricula and, and, and programs where they pair training in public health with training in a core discipline, whether it's nutrition, nursing, health kinesiology, whatever it may be. And, and, and merging those two has, has its place. But the model that we're uh, uh, approaching is we're going to provide the training in public health through our core classes. But we want our students to have the best training in their concentration courses. So they're going to be taking their health science courses with health science majors, not the powder puff version that, that might have been in a public health program. Right? So when they come out, they're going to know the science, and they're going to know how public health professionals can use that science to the public's good. Uh, so we have sort of an open campus model. We don't have faculty that we've hired exclusively to be public health faculty, at least at this point. Instead, we have the whole campus to draw from, all the courses that are out there. We have our competencies identified, and we can figure out what courses and what faculty on campus will help us meet those competencies. That'll allow us to design tailored uh, uh, study plans of study for our students, each one of them can have the array of courses that will set them best up for, for professional, uh, their professional goals. Uh, we have uh, yet to identify our signature, but I assure you we will eventually be the best at something. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we will find out what that something is. Uh, as, you know, we, we were talking about it with our external advisory board at lunch and reluctantly came to the conclusion we weren't going to decide it at lunch. Um, but, but, but it's not something we will uh, uh, let pass us by. It will be an ongoing process and we will tackle it. Um, and so uh, at that point, I will turn it over and the next three speakers will talk about uh, our three concentrations and and examples of what we're doing on campus relative to them. So, Cleve. So, this is me, the different things I'm involved with. I'm involved with Reagan Street. I always like to list all these, it makes me look busy. Um, and my department chair is here and he always wonders what I'm doing. So, these are some of the things I'm doing. Uh, this is a famous paper uh, by Jim House um, that established quite a long time ago, in 1988, the powerful effect of social stratification on health. He basically showed that poverty and poor social relationships were as strong an effect on our health as smoking. Um, and so this was one of the first things that sort of demonstrated the importance of social relationships on our health and the importance of intervening and taking into account the social determinants of health. This is a recent paper that looks at the same thing and quantifies these effects even more strongly. And I yellowed these out, but I, it's hard to, I'm gonna get yelled at for moving. Uh, but it's nearly, the social embeddedness, being embedded in a social environment, being embedded in a social network, uh, it decreases mortality by two times. You know, being really connected with people has a powerful effect on you. Um, a measure of social in uh, integration predicted 90% greater survival or, well, for those of us who are into logistic regression, one point nine something, uh, greater survival. Participati 
participation in a broad range of social relationships, including active engagement in a variety of social activities or relationships, and a sense of community and identification with one's social roles. The more you are part of something bigger than yourself, the more likely you are to have a longer life. Isn't that a great thing? I mean, in a way, that's like being at Purdue. Um, you can't go anywhere around here without, there's no anonymity around here. Um, so social relationships provide us with healthy environments for living, and they also shield us and protect us when we are buffeted by disasters or stressors or problems, or for the undergraduates, tests, um, which we're the stressors, us professors. When social relationships fail, loneliness is a predictive of morbidity and mortality. I remember when I worked at the med school, John Capio, I don't know how to say his name, but anyway, this guy. Um, he came and presented in the psychiatry department where I was working, and the head, um, the head of psychiatry just poo-pooed the whole thing because it didn't involve a pill. And we all said, you just don't have enough friends. Um, <laughs> which was probably true because he was the kind of guy who pissed people off all the time. Um, that's a technical term that we use in mental health. Um, marital discord raises the risk of obesity and insulin resistance. Janet Keith Colt Glazer, a fantastic researcher at Ohio State. You know, relationships matter. Our, the, inter, the quality of our interpersonal relationships matter and carry, you know, just can be a great protective factor in our health or can be a bad thing for our health. Good marriages are good, bad marriages are not so good. Parenting behaviors are associated with children's health problems. So let me address one of the great beliefs that we have, because uh, we study families in my department, um, that the American family is falling apart. People like to believe this. I, I teach a course on this. Um, not that the, I don't teach a course on the American family is falling apart. No, I teach a course about the American family. Um, and so here's a picture of all kinds of people. Families come in all sizes and shapes. Uh, families are changing. That is the truth of, of the family. F people are marrying later. My son is finally engaged. He's 29 years old. I've been wondering all along, what the heck are you waiting for? Um, but that's my problem. I'm 61 years old. I was married when I was 24, which was two years older than my father. People change, you know, the world is changing about us. Some of you who are my age probably have kids and you're, you're wondering, what the heck are they waiting for? They're on their own time frame. The world is changing. Kids are, each generation does things their own way. It doesn't mean the family's falling apart. I'll, there'll be a little more coming here. Women are becoming more educated than men. And the hilarious part of this, I wrote this last week, um, and the exponent today or yesterday had an article about this. You know, the guys are falling behind. Um, we're having fewer children, uh, spending more time with them, one could argue. Gender roles are changing, thank God. Of course, I teach in my class that the more, which the guys in the back of the class, because the guys all sit in the back of my marriage and family class, the women are all in the front, um, and you know, the more, this is just a hint for you, the more housework that men do, the more it's shared, the more intimacy there is in that marriage, uh, just a hint. Uh, you can, <laughs> I'll let you figure out what that means. Um, the divorce rates are 50%, but there's a lot of nuance to that. Higher education, older age at marriage, secure finances mean longer marriage and less risk of divorce. But the, I'll tell you even more about that as we go along. I'm just trying to put this whole thing in perspective about what's happening with families. Um, medium age at first marriage. Well, here it is. Here's 1960, 22. Now, here's the median age for men is, is almost 29 years old and uh, 27, almost 27 for women now. So it's a family falling apart or is it just changing? This is my favorite slide that I show in my classes. If you're a woman with a college degree, you're nearly 80% likely to still be married to the same man 
20 years later. So the divorce rate at 50% is a misnomer. It's a myth. It means it's very stratified. If you're highly educated, you're going to probably have a stable family life. If you're not highly educated, you're going to struggle. So one of the things that's been talked about has been disparities, healthcare inequities, healthcare disparities. They really hit the bottom end of the education and uh, poverty uh, levels in our society. Those are the people who are suffering more than people like us who are educated. And one of the things I say to my class, what happens to you when you're in college? Why does, a, why does having a college degree make a difference? Is it just because you know a bunch of stuff and now they, they struggle with it and they realize it's, it's the skills we have to acquire to get this college degree? Self-control, perseverance, you know, because when you're married, you're going to piss people off, like your spouse. <laughs> Aren't you, right? Some of you may never have done that. I do, it every, I do it every day. I said to my wife one time, you know, I'm a therapist. I, I like to navel gaze. I said, you know, we're so happy. We get along. We get along great. Why do you think that is? And she said, it's because I finally figured out you're never going to change, and I just have to put up with you the way you are. <laughs> so... Here's a, a graph of the United States and some problems that we're facing, which really look just like a graph you had up earlier. Except this is teen births. I can't remember what the one you had, but it looked almost exactly like this. What was the one you had up? High school education. All right, so she had one that was high school education. It looked almost like this. This is teen births. You can see what do we have up here. Uh, mostly the most concentration of teen births, the highest rate is in the South. This is the part of the country where uh, there's a higher rate of not getting your high school diploma. There's also a higher rate of not having sex education, higher rate of not teaching kids about contraceptives. So there's a higher rate of teen births. Not surprising to me, but a, a huge public, uh, public health problem. Here's just some numbers about it. Indiana's sort of in between that. Here's the, the most liberal parts of the country have the lowest teen birth rates. It's a shock. Um, the most conservative parts of the country have some of the highest teen birth rates. And here's one more thing. Age of mothers at first birth. Higher education, the rate of birth, rate of uh, the age at first birth is nearly 30. Uh, and you can see it's been pretty steady with low education, a little bit less than 20. Uh, Birth to unmarried mothers. Whoops, pretty high. Oops, pressing the wrong button, sorry. Anyway, the whole point of all that, lower education, those folks, lower education, lower income, at greater risk for most all of the bad how outcomes that you can imagine. So families have always been in transition. Before modern medicine, mothers died of childbirth and children died of infections that we've heard about historically. Many children, you know, we think the family was at one point perfect. That's not true at all. Children are often, parents died of these horrible diseases and many children were raised by non-parents. Children were sent from their homes at an early age to start their work lives and they were 14 or 15 apprenticed out. Uh, now we face new challenges to help families and children have good lives. So our faculty who are part of this concentration are doing a lot of things to assess, to address these, these challenges. The Military Family Institute, led by Shelley McDermott Wadsworth, is working very hard to meet military family needs as, as people go through all the challenges of deployment, <clears throat> deployment and reentry. Uh, Elliot Friedman addresses aging and late life families working, it, they just uh, submitted a, a large intervention study to look at how do you maintain your sense of purpose in life and social integration. Uh, Melissa Franks uh, works on how spouses help each other toward better health. She and I published a paper together not too long ago about a table for two, looking at how spouses' eating habits are very similar to each other. Um, health promote, whoops. Darn, I keep pressing the wrong button. Trigger thumb. Um, Frank Snyder 
who is one of the cluster hires, looks at health promotion and at-risk youth and preventing substance abuse. Sarah Smith looks at community and family factors and school readiness and poor children. Again, looking at people and children and families who are at risk. Blake Jones looks at reducing the risk of obesity and sleep problems for minority and poor children. Again, targeting kids at risk and families at risk. Yumeri Ruiz looks at reducing teen pregnancies, especially repeat. She gave a great talk about that recently in our department. And Stuart Chang Alexander, one of my partners in crime, we've published some papers together, improving communication at end of life and care for sexual minorities. Stuart and I showed in a couple papers that doctors talk to their teenage patients about sex for 36 seconds at most in a, in a preventive care session. My own family doctor came into the session and looked at me and said, so I don't talk to my teenage patients about sex enough, huh? I said, well, apparently not. Um, <laughs> I said, how did you know that? That paper's everywhere. <laughs> My own research is mostly focused on physician-patient communication. I'm doing a multi-site study on cancer pain management with colleagues in Rochester, where I used to be, in Mich and also in Michigan. I'm doing a non -chronic, I'm looking at chronic pain uh, with a non-cancer group with uh, colleagues down at IUPUI. Uh, Stuart Alexander and I and a couple of grad students have been looking at sexual minority health uh, with funds from the from the uh, CTSI, and I'm working right now through the Reagan Street Center, looking at type two diabetes management with uh, perhaps a pharmacist intervention with a couple of rural hospitals in Connorsville and Rushville uh, and working with the Indiana Rural Health Association trying to figure out if we can uh, incorporate pharmacist interventions with, uh, with elderly patients who are, whose diabetes is out of control. And we're hoping to submit this grant to the NIDDK. We're pretty excited about that. And it's really been fun to get out in the rural communities where they haven't been able to, they, they're really excited about being part of a, a they want to sort of be a part of a living laboratory, and I think this is a great opportunity for a lot of our faculty to, to branch out and work in some of these rural areas. So to cap off, what about families and communities? Families are the fundamental building blocks of most societies throughout history and around the world. There's no better alternative that has been found. Families, whatever their diverse form are, Children's first teachers and a primary source of social support for their members. They prepare their members to be productive citizens. They sow the seeds of health habits for life. They provide significant amounts of caregiving that nations would have a hard time replacing. Family-focused systems of care are not well developed outside of the family, but there is considerable evidence to show they're needed. And this is the end. That's all I have to say, and I'm, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here, and uh, my name is Jim Schweitzer. Some of you may know me in my role as Director of Radiological and Environmental Management or as, as uh, some folks say at their universities, environmental health and safety. I'm also in the School of Health Sciences, and really the story I want to tell today is really about collaboration, how we've collaborated over the years, how we will continue to co collaborate, and how Purdue is a perfect place for that collaboration. Well, uh, I want to tell you just a really short story about how our group, Radiological Environmental Management, came about. Uh, it, it really was, was funny how that happened, and it originated in 1948. It was actually, uh, uh, even before the naming of the Bionucleonics Department, many of you knew John Christian, who started the Bionucleonics Department, and, and through an executive memorandum from President, then President Hovde, he became responsible for 
uh, controlling the use of radioactive material at Purdue University. And, and the legend has it that Purdue was shipped one of the first uh, batches of radioactive material from Oak Ridge uh, National Lab. And, and so that began there. And so as a result of that, we found a need to control radioactive material. So it was called radiological control. And, and as, as time came about, and because of new regulations, uh, specifically uh, OSHA, EPA uh, in the 70s, it was determined that we needed to control more than radioactive material. So we controlled chemicals as well. So, so really, our, our early efforts in there were, I, I think, uh, a little rudimentary in that we're just getting our legs under us. And, and faculty here at Purdue, we understood some of the risks of chemicals. And, and certainly, uh, the evidence now is uh, we didn't understand all the risks. And, and today, we're still learning all those risks. And I'll talk about a few of those uh, in a little bit. And if you come to today, uh, we're now uh, radiological and environmental management. So we have environmental in our name. And, and uh, the nice thing is that we share a great partnership with the School of Health Sciences and, and many other departments, uh, nuclear engineering, a, a lot of places where, where our job is to foster that research. And uh, in many cases, we serve, uh, serve uh, with graduate student support. I actually was supported as a graduate student in radiological control. So I would never have known that I would be back uh, doing some of the same types of things after I graduated. Uh, we employ a number of undergrads. Uh, we do internships. We served as an exchange site for exchange students from the Dublin Institute of Technology. So, so we're really, uh, our role in, in giving our, our graduates and our students uh, opportunities to sort of figure out what they might do uh, when they get, get a real job, I, I think we take that very seriously. And, and actually, it's great to see them develop and, more importantly, get that experience and then go out and, and really blossom. So that's really great fun to see that. So we have uh, lots of definitions, and I'm not going to read this. You can certainly see that. But uh, it, it's all about the physical, chemical, and, and biological factors. And so it's all those outside things. So you can see the World Health Organization has their definition, uh, and, and also the National Environmental Health Association has theirs. And, and really, it can be quite broad. I mean, it, it includes uh, man-made hazards. It includes natural hazards. Uh, it can go as far as you like it. So there's a lot of room for interpretation there. So uh, it's really uh, encompasses a good portion of, of public health. So what are all the disciplines? You can see those there. Epidemiology, toxicology, uh, engineering, medicine, uh, justice, um, and then other advocacy things. So certainly as we, as we look at these environmental factors, and assess them and want to control them, um, I, I think it's also part of our jobs to, to be an advocate for public health and to address some of the issues that we, that we have in the world. So this is a little uh, tough to see, but uh, this is the top 10 chemical, chemicals of concern from the World Health Organization. And so I'm going to go on to the next slide, and so you can see that a little bit better. And some of those you might certainly expect. Air pollution, we've had people talk about that already. Uh, uh, 3.1 premature, 3.1 million premature deaths from air pollution. And so that's something where, although we know very well about it, uh, we, we struggle uh, because of the way of life we want to have and, and the technologies we want to keep. So that's really, really di difficult. Uh, arsenic. Uh, is used, been used for, for many years in pesticides, as many of you might know. Uh, arsenic occurs in drinking water uh, around the world. Asbestos, well, you, you would have thought we would have had a handle on asbestos by now. Well, we, we certainly don't. Uh, there's over 120, uh, can't see that, 107,000 deaths 
from exposure to asbestos in 2004. Um, we even here at Purdue, we still wrestle with asbestos. Many of our buildings were built prior to 1980 and still contain asbestos. Our goal is to manage that. And in the developing worlds, um, it's very, very difficult because uh, they don't have the resources to properly manage that. Uh, so you, we can keep on going. Uh, uh, the metals, mercury, lead, cadmium, again, all of those uh, we need to do what we do in an industrialized nation. And I was, uh, had another presentation, and uh, during my research, I found out that we have released over 350 million tons of mercury to the environment. And we still are wrestling with that in terms of uh, individuals uh, eating seafood, uh, deposition, and we still continue to re uh, release mercury and many of these other metals as we uh, do mining and, and use in um, our techn technological society. And last but not least is pesticides. Uh, we need pesticides, and certainly they, they contribute to much of our well-being in terms of producing the food that we need to eat, but uh, what about exposure? Uh, lots of both intentional and non-intentional ex exposures to pesticides that have caused uh, many, many deaths. So let's take a look maybe a little bit closer to home. What about some environmental health issues in the United States? Certainly, we don't lack any. Um, occupationally, we look at solvents, we look at heavy metals, pesticides, um, nanomaterials, um, and then the one that I, it sort of struck me last week, I was driving down I-65 on the way to Indianapolis, and they're doing the construction on the interstate. And so they have lots of guys that lay concrete, and they were sawing concrete, and a cloud of this dust, well, most of you know, well, that's silica dust. And, and so even with everything we have, we still, uh, the guy that was working, he had uh, 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 a Tyvek suit on, well protected with safety glass, glasses and had a respirator, but all the guys around him and the drivers driving down the interstate, I didn't have my respirator with me, so <laughs> I was not protected. So uh, I actually wrote an email to, to in the, uh, Indiana DOT commenting on that, so we'll, I haven't got a response back yet, so uh, it's probably saving me money to, to not use wet sawing methods. Uh, so let's look at some of the, you know, the, the, the real issues that, that we focus on sometimes aren't the same issues that the media and the internet focuses on, and so how do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, Probably uh, something that I've seen more than not is that radiation is always a topic. Um, it doesn't matter if it's releases from nuclear power plants, routine releases, or in the case of Chernobyl or Fukushima. Uh, certainly uh, that gets a lot of press, but perhaps not, as earlier speaker says, not commensurate with the hazard there. Uh, medical exposures. Uh, and certainly, should I have a CT? When do I have a CT? How much radiation? What's the risk? And so that's something that, uh, you know, even radiation, which is the most studied carcinogen ever, we still don't have the answers there. Uh, Non-ionizing radiation cell phones. Uh, been uh, some recent reports, and um, I think my wife said one of the, the TV pundits was talking, was talking about cell phone radiation. And so. Uh, what's, the, what's the real risk there? And I think part of that uh, is incumbent on us to help communicate that. Uh, uh, ge genetically modified organisms, again, something that benefits us greatly, but a lot of countries in the European Union uh, don't look very kindly on GMOs. So what, what's the real story? And so I think we need to uh, help get that out there as well. Uh, mold, certainly uh, that's a topic uh, that we visit frequently here at Purdue. Uh, uh, one, of, one of our biggest jobs is doing indoor air quality investigations. My office smells a little bit funny, 
uh, and so I would like you to check it for mold. Uh, most of the time, uh, we don't find any mold that's different from what's outside. Every now and again, if there's a water leak or, or something that's a little bit out of a judgment, uh, out of adjustment, we do find that. So uh, we keep busy and we reassure the people that there, there is a uh, healthful environment. But a lot of times, the black mold uh, story has gotten a little bit out of hand. And then probably the, one of the most latest ones is processed and red meats. And so you can see there at the cover of Time, it says the title there is The War on Delicious. And, <laughs> and so, and so um, many of you know that uh, when you cook meat, especially bacon there, uh, you may produce uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or, or, or other compounds that could be hazardous to your health. So again, uh, uh, heterocyclic amines and, and other things. So we need to figure out the true risk. Is the risk there? It, it sounds like it from the work. Uh, compare it to smoking, and again, that, uh, that risk is, is really pretty low. So what's our role in, uh, in environmental health education? Well, I think we have a, a, a really big role to actually train individuals who can look at these problems, address these problems, assess these problems, and then communicate these problems. So all of those skills, as you see up there, uh, are, are really, really important for our graduates that they get this sound and well-rounded curriculum so they, they can uh, figure out uh, how to get people to act on these problems. And that includes people, that includes the government and, and other individuals as well. Uh, the, the one nice thing is that uh, we have opportunities to practically train these individuals. So we have uh, internships and projects. And I think uh, uh, in radiological environmental management, we welcome the ability to give those students a little bit of uh, uh, practical experiment. And then really important, uh, you really can't uh, give these students the full picture without them having some exposure to research. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Again, uh, it's, it's a collaborative work that, that goes across all disciplines, and I think that's necessary for our students to fully understand what they're getting into when they become a, a public health professional. And so I'd like to highlight a few of those. Um, the first is uh, uh, the research from uh, Drs. Freeman and Sepulveda in forestry and natural resources. And so they're looking at the underlying uh, genetic and epigenetic mechanisms of toxicity of environmental uh, stressors. That includes lead, uh, atrazine, and radiation. And so they're having a look at the, with the zebrafish model uh, to look at those uh, to actually give us some ideas from a, from a genetic perspective what's, what's going on. The next group uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Jason Cannon and Dr. Chris Roche, and they're looking at uh, neuro neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and the role of environmental factors and genetic susceptibility uh, and how that plays a role in disease pathogenesis. And, and so we're, we're looking at a number of these things, including uh, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, to see how they may play, play a role uh, in the development of Parkinson's. And uh, Jason's also uh, working with a new model for, a new rat model for Parkinson's disease. And then uh, uh, we have another uh, research group uh, where we're, we're taking uh, innovative technology in combination with uh, epidemiology and toxicology. And Dr. Nye and, and Dr. Wells, one of our cluster hires, and uh, Dr. Zhang are looking at the role of, of, of manganese and neurogeneration, and then also developing a way to look at uh, heavy metals such as manganese and lead in the bone to make an accurate uh, assessment of their previous exposure. Certainly, blood lead levels are pretty good, but uh, Dr. Nyes found out that actually uh, blood uh, bone level, or lead bone levels 
are a better indicator of, of previous exposures. So that's uh, very interesting work, and they've done that work uh, a little bit in the United States, and they are doing that in China as well, to uh, children exposed to lead and uh, workers exposed to manganese in the smelters in China. And then finally, uh, we, uh, one of the, I guess, call it the secondary pillars of excellence, and, and that is uh, the development of a uh, toxicology and engineering. And they have a cross-functional team that will look at uh, solvents in the environment. And so you can see that this truly is a collaborative uh, group here across all facets of campus. And so I think this is a really exciting time uh, for, the, for the public health program uh, to embrace the pillars and, and for everyone to give our, gra our graduate students and undergrads uh, the best opportunity to succeed. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Hao Zhang. I'm a professor and head of Department of Statistics. Um, first, congratulations to the launch of the uh, Public Health Graduate Program. Uh, public health is such an important area that everyone can understand, as President Daniels uh, marked. And that's non-controversial, too. I think even the Congress would agree on this. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, as Dean Gladys mentioned, statistics uh, was uh, uh, one of the first departments that developed the joint program, was uh, a public health program. So really, I uh, uh, celebrate with you about the launch of the program. I'm looking forward to uh, further collaboration and uh, I wish the best for the program. And I hope the excellent something Rick was looking for would be health statistics. That's something I'm going to talk about next. Uh, as I said, uh, health issues are important. They are vital to a society. Uh, uh, and uh, for example, physical activities, of course, uh, that's common sense that um, uh, you do that, that's uh, their the benefits to your, your body. Um, uh, however, it's a different story how to make people to be more active. And there are active studies about uh, environment, environment build, uh, how to design the building and the trail and the issue that can help people to be more active with this. Um, Nutrition, of course, what to eat, that's very important, and continuous study. Uh, perhaps after we solved the energy and climate challenges, issues, this public health issues still stay because it's so complex. Uh, obesity is, is, a, is such a challenge worldwide, uh, and, and diet and disease, and so on. And, and these issues are complex too. Uh, and here is an example that uh, Jim also mentioned that uh, this, the red meat, processed meat. Uh, 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 WHO just uh, published uh, uh, something that they say that uh, there is, if you can read this, uh, there is limited evidence that uh, um, the red meat will cause cancer. That's strong magnetic evidence. So uh, the limited evidence, uh, my interpretation would be statistical evidence of this. But they say there's strong significant evidence that processed meat will ca cause cancer. And then there's a re reaction about this. The Journal of a Economist has an article to kind of criticize, and here's a newspaper from Australia. So how do we believe uh, WHO has 22 experts They look into literature and draw such a conclusion? Uh, and uh, these newspapers also have good reputation. I mean, these this kind of issues we deal with so complex. I think for me, I'm going to from now on listen to what Rick says, <laughs> but what try to eat. Uh, so, um, 
So often uh, we deal with this, not like in engineering or so, we have clear physical principle to guide our knowledge or understanding. But when you deal with health issues, you're so complex. So how do you find the, the truth of this? I think you would, need, you would depend on data. You would depend on data. Um, and there's also a lot of variations among individuals. Let's make the study so uh, it's challenging, complex. Something is evident at one individual, you may not be so at another. Uh, some smokers live a long life. Right? Um, so we got confounding factors. So we really need to know uh, to have knowledge discovery through data. Um, all right, here's uh, health statistics. Uh, uh, some would interpret uh, statistics as data. Well, that, that, that's, that's fine. Uh, when you talk about statistics, of course, there's data, particularly in the, in the area of uh, uh, um, health um, uh, statistics. The federal and state governments also collect data, uh, so we have data. Uh, at uh, individual level, uh, and often they are longitudinal, meaning that you collect data from the sa same individual over a period of time, and you observe and you, you study and draw certain conclusion. And they could be also uh, aggregated at the county level, or, or city level, or state level. Yeah, these are kind of characteristics of, of public uh, health data. And the data also could be from uh, different uh, uh, health studies. There are so many of this going on about obesity, about uh, different uh, health effects, and some of you know, know, know better than I do, I think. Um, and I see what's coming is the modern te technology to collect data, uh, and there's more and more like this. You put a sensor on, you get 24-hour uh, uh, monitoring data that coming in, and Apple has this, you, you heard about this uh, health, health kit data, and the Apple Watch will, will uh, just send data to you. You know, you can detect whether the person is sitting there or is, uh, is active, or, uh, or the kind of pattern they do. Um, so the, this kind of new data, I think I expected them are going to be more and more such such data in, in public health studies. Um, but for me, uh, health statistics uh, means more about uh, methodology analysis uh, uh, and statistical modeling. So, so often we need to find uh, significant relationships. If only I can answer those questions, I can answer a lot of questions what caused obesity, right? What caused cancer? It is red meat, processed meat, uh, signif has a significant uh, correlation with, with cancer? This kind of answers that we, questions we like to answer. Um, so all, well, that's not just for health statistics, but in general, that's, uh, that, that's what the statisticians do. Um, uh, but what's, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's Different and new in this day is uh, often we deal with larger number of variables, and data gets bigger and bigger because the new way of collecting data and uh, it's, it's cheaper to collect data. So we have more data. So we have big data. Uh, how big is so big? If you can handle on your computer or PC, uh, that's not big data. Right? <laughs> big data means you cannot handle in a single computer. That's what it means. So uh, perhaps you should. Uh, uh, think about not to use SAS because SAS will not be enough. Uh, uh, but still, that's, that's okay for now, but it's coming. Or, uh, you know, some of my colleagues have terabytes of data. Uh, you cannot um, work on those data for, uh, on a single machine. Um, Produce statistics uh, is one of the prominent statistic departments in the world, uh, and uh, we have um, um, very talented people of seven uh, fellows and two past presidents of American Statistical Association. Um, 
the, uh, the faculty work on uh, theory, methods, the computation for emerging problems. Uh, the department has a great emphasis on uh, interdisciplinary uh, research and has a very open mind. We believe that it's the uh, real issue, the real problem that drives the study. Therefore, we'd really like to talk to your folks about the, uh, the, the real issue that impact the world and we'd like to collaborate with you. And to solve the challenge you showed, I believe you need, uh, you need to be good at computation. You need to be good at, uh, at theory because we get new challenges, we have new types of data, we need new methodology. Uh, we, uh, these are some of the research specialties. Uh, we have a large group of people working on bioinformatics, uh, 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 some work on data visualization, and uh, some uh, uh, really good experts in these areas. Machine learning is, uh, some call it machine learning, and we, we also call that statistical learning, and nobody knows the difference, except machine learning sounds, sounds a little bit catchy, maybe. Uh, um, and some work on spatial environmental statistics, computational statistics, and some also work on probability of this. Uh, and we have um, uh, several faculty, number, uh, faculty members work on health uh, issues. Um, uh, Rebecca Dorch, uh, our distinguished professor, works on breast cancer studies for several years. And my co colleague, George McCabe, who, who is sitting over there, yeah. has uh, this uh, uh, very productive and sustained collaboration uh, in uh, nutrition studies. Uh, Bill Cleveland is, big, uh, is working on big data and is one of the two statisticians that coined the term data science. Um, uh, Bruce Craig and I are also work on spatial statistics uh, um, uh, and I also have uh, some, uh, some projects related to, to health issues. Lin Sun Zhang has a joint appointment uh, uh, between statistics and regenerative uh, center and working on healthcare engineering. And, and just, uh, um, this is one of the uh, projects I uh, participated in and, and you know, since I work on spatial statistics, uh, you can uh, clearly identify some spatial clusters uh, and the high and the low, and this is the, uh, and the likelihood of obesity in, in the state of Pennsylvania. And you'd wonder, uh, there's got to be something going on there after you filled out race, age, education, and uh, what is, uh, what, there got to be some, something going on there. Is, is that environmental? Is that air? Is that water? Is that culture? So we can, uh, uh, dig more into that. Um, another study here is to uh, uh, survey um, about 1,200 people uh, on the uh, five sides of the trail and try to study how the, um, uh, the trail affects the physical activity. We classify phys uh, physical activity into moderate and rigorous of this. Uh, and you put uh, um, the GPS, uh, such, uh, what is that? You, you, anyway, you, can, you, you, just, you, you put that device uh, to the backpack and it can tell whether you're, your speed, whether you're active or not. So there's a, a, a positive association between trail use and total physical activity and uh, uh, moderate uh, uh, physical activity, and all depend on statistical methods of this. So I think the statistic in general is a tool to find something that's complex. We, do, we, have, we uh, kind of lack a scientific principle, a physical principle to, to guide. So therefore, it should be uh, very useful in health issues. Thank you so much. I'm brand new, so I don't have a lot to talk about what I've accomplished yet. Um, I found the copy machine today, so that was a big accomplishment. 
so I've spent the last about 10 years at the National Institutes of Health. So this is a big change for me to come to an academic uh, setting. And the last two years of my time at the NIH, I completed an MPH program at Johns Hopkins. So I'm excited to see that Purdue's invested in, in this very important program. So all of us who do public health work have a core of disease prevention and health promotion. And I come at this through the lens of nutrition, which I think is the most important exposure that we have. So when looking at signature areas for the department, I would certainly suggest nutrition because that's one thing that we all have in common. We all eat. But what's different about nutrition is that it's modifiable. We make choices every day, three meals a day, what we eat, what we put into our bodies. So we have the power to change public health through nutrition. So I have the areas that I have focused on in the past and some of which I hope to focus on here at Purdue. Uh, most importantly, the ones that I would like to highlight are aging and global health. So thank you. My name is Blake Jones and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies. I'm actually an alumni of Purdue, so I'm happy to be back here. I've been back for a little over two years. And my primary area of research is in children's health and how that relates to daily family routines. Specifically, if you're going to study children, you have to think about the family because these young kids are not making these choices by themselves. They don't live in a vacuum. Um, for example, if I was to look at two children in childcare who are fed the same food from, let's say, 7 in the morning till 5 p.m., one might be obese and the other one is not. And so the bulk of their waking hours are together, they're eating the same foods, and yet you could have a vast difference in obesity. And so to me, my, my main research areas are the things that tend to happen in the evenings. So things like family meal times, family bedtime schedules, um, even parent work schedules and how that plays a role into how children are eating and how their physical activity goes and just basically routines that they're doing. I have several ongoing projects here. Um, I'm very big into collaboration and so I, I love to work with other groups and I see a lot of value and so I agree with Reagan about uh, nutrition. I work a lot with people in nutrition um, and I'm, I'm happy to see that um, you can look at a lot of different things in different age groups and there's different issues that children face but all of those come back to some kind of connection with the family. So for example, one of the predictors that has come out in research with child obesity is things like having a TV in your bedroom. I can't work with two and three year olds and convince them to remove the TV out of their own room, right? I have to get parents on board. And yet, when you get parents to try and do this, they don't do the intervention. And so we need things like public health to educate them and understand why this is important. Parents say, it's not worth the fight. My child just throws a big fit, and I'm not going to deal with it. And you think, well, if you can't deal with a two-year-old's fight about a TV in their room, what are you going to do later on when there's bigger problems, right? I, bedroom TVs, to me, are one of the most modifiable risk behaviors we can possibly think of. In two minutes, it's either there or it's not. And yet, people don't buy into that. And so when you think about these, these interventions, we have to get parents on board. A lot of my studies um, also look at children that are in poverty, um, specifically groups that are more at risk than others. And I have a, a, a couple of my current projects. Project Salud is looking at um, adolescents, particularly fifth and sixth grade Latino children and their parents. Um, you might not know this, but just 30 or 40 minutes down the road to the east of us, in some of the communities like Frankfurt, the schools are over 50% Latino. You might not know that it's that high, but there are some great people in the schools who've really helped us to, to access the families there, and we're learning all kinds of things about their health. And so we're collecting um, saliva and other things so we can really look at stress hormones and really get a picture of some um, um, objective measurements of their health and see how that plays out in obesity and some of these daily routines. Uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, congratulations to the public health program. I'm Tim McGraw from the Computer Graphics Technology Department, and my interests are in scientific and information visualization. I've got a couple images from recent projects here, and, and what me and my students do isn't uh, restricted to just graphic design types of projects, but there's also generally a strong data analysis, statistical analysis uh, process that goes into developing these visualizations. We get noisy data, we get images with artifacts, um, we have to extract some sort of high-level features to visualize, like the neuronal connectivity you see in the top row of images there. And we also are interested in developing interactive techniques to encourage people to, to explore the data and, and 
find interesting features in, in the data on their own. Um, so the top row of images there are neuronal connectivity, uh, visualizations of the brain, taking a couple of different approaches here. So depending on the task, different types of visualizations may be more appropriate, the one on the, the left being more of a scientific visualization type of approach. On the right, more of a discrete uh, information visualization uh, graph-based approach. So our goal is to enable users to gain insights into their data, um, extract some meaning in the case of, of the medical images, make more efficient, uh, more accurate diagnoses, and, and hopefully reduce uh, healthcare costs and improve the quality of healthcare. So I'm talking about some of the, some of the interesting features that are in images, and specifically in, in medical images. Um, Shape is a very interesting uh, high-level feature, and shape analysis has been very popular in the medical imaging uh, field. Uh, one of the famous examples is the connection between the shape of the hippocampus and schizophrenia. Uh, so one of my first uh, master's students is going to defend a thesis about decomposing shapes into their constituent parts. So the example we see there with the uh, skeletal hand and each finger being, being isolated and the various bones being isolated. This could be a, a critical part to, to doing shape analysis studies uh, based on medical images. So I am interested in, in images at this scale. I'm also doing some projects at uh, the molecular scale, working with some data from Eli Lilly. And of course, if you have any interesting data, any interesting visualization or analysis problems, uh, do be sure to get in touch. Uh, I've got some contact info uh, in the link at the bottom of the slide there. So thank you. Hi, my name is Libby Richards. I'm with the School of Nursing, and my research area is population level physical activity promotion. And I've started by examining interpersonal or social and also motivational influences of physical activity and using an understanding of these influences to develop and test physical activity interventions. So this research started by looking at dog walking and trying to understand why people walk their dogs and how can we manipulate that behavior and translate it to other behaviors. And what I found out was people walk their dogs for their dogs and don't think about that it's good for them. And canine and animal health foundations have been good to me and have allowed me to study this research area. And now what we're doing is taking that information and seeing if we can influence other types of social partnerships um, and influence behavior change that way. So I have a new um, interdisciplinary research group. I think we're a powerhouse. It's three awesome researchers here at Purdue. And we're starting an intervention study to look at the role of spouses and different collaborative relationships in terms of promoting physical activity. So I'm very excited to be part of this collaboration. And hopefully, you will see more of that coming out. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Frank Snyder, and my background's in health behavior and health promotion um, from Oregon State University. So it's good to see uh, Dean Bray on the, on the advisory committee. Um, my background has really looked at youth health risk behaviors and healthy development. So child and adolescent health, and also looking at interventions designed to improve those outcomes. So just to give you a, a quick example, uh, we, we look at either school and community-based interventions, and we can look at them at, uh, in a rather rigorous way. For example, randomizing schools to conditions, just like in the uh, medical literature, randomizing uh, treatment, uh, treatment to group. So um, one example 
to, to, to share um, that's going on locally with colleagues of mine in the, the Department of Health and Kinesiology and also in, in 4-H is a program called PALS and it involves a, kids who participate in a summer, uh, summer program who um, are involved in physical activity uh, f physical activities but also there's this infusion of social and emotional and character development pillars as they call them so it gives children who come from low-income families an opportunity to participate in a program during the summer months but then also the 4-H component is an extension where they're also able to participate in programming structured supervised activities during uh, after school hours during the school year. Um, so it's an interesting um, opportunity and it's currently funded by uh, NIFA and in in USDA and look forward to um, doing more work both locally and, and nationally related to prevention science, which has made a lot of strides over the past couple decades. And also, I just wanted to point out real quickly that Dr. Shields and Dr. Klein, some of the, 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 the data they showed related to school dropout and teen pregnancies, well, interventions designed to uh, work with children's social, emotional, and character development have been shown to have an effect on multiple components and outcomes related to health. So starting early, starting young um, is, is a key piece and a lot of uh, research is pointing to the importance of focusing on young children. So thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Ellen Wells and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Health Sciences and I'm an environmental epidemiologist. And I'll try and keep the description of um, my work pretty short because I know I'm the last thing on the program here. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start out by, um, by saying that there are a couple major themes in which I like to frame all the work I'm doing. Um, in the past, research with environmental related exposures, we know a lot about what happens in the short term, and we know a lot about what happens if you have a really high dose of an exposure, and we know a lot about what happens from one exposure, right? But the world is a lot more complicated than that. We're exposed to things in the environment over the entirety of our lives, we're exposed to low concentrations in many cases, and we're exposed to many different things at the same time, right? So a lot of studies have measured dozens of environmental chemicals and um, metals, pesticides, in the blood of any random American, right? So all of us are walking around with environmental chemical exposure or environmental metal exposure. So we need to figure out what that's doing to us. Right? So major themes that I've centered my research around are looking at the impacts of multiple exposures at the same time. If you're exposed to more than one compound, are the results worse than if you're exposed to either one alone? Could they be synergistic? We really don't know, so that's a big area to look into. I'm also looking into um, areas of developmental origins of adult disease, right? So new research has come out recently suggesting that very early life exposures can stay with us throughout the rest of our lives and affect adult onset diseases, right? So that's really hard to study in human populations, which is what I do but I'm looking at ways to get at that particular question. Right. And I focus on research on metals, including lead, mercury, and manganese. Uh, these were all mentioned earlier by Jim Schweitzer, and he also talked about some of my research earlier. Um, but I've got two major projects that are going on right now, and both are strong collaborations with other faculty members in my department. So the one um, Jim Schweitzer already mentioned, it is a collaborative study in China where we're looking at manganese exposure in smelters. And we're trying to understand 
how long-term exposure instead of short-term exposure might have an impact. And another collaboration right here in Lafayette, we're doing a study on um, welders and how they might be exposed to manganese. And also I've added a component looking at a lot of other metals as well in metals that are present in the bloodstream. Right. So that's actually an interesting story because when we started doing the study, we learned recently that more of the workers are now wearing respirators than they used to. So doing the research had a very positive impact on their potential exposures and potential health. And I have a lot of other projects coming in the future, but I'll wait until then to tell you about it. <laughs> okay, well, thank you again for, for coming and, and staying. I, I, you have just seen a glimmer of uh, what this new program has and, and the promise that, that it has. Uh, we will release you to the reception, but I do want to just leave you with a parting thought. As I said at the beginning, uh, we view all who came as people who are interested in the success of our program, and we are interested in your feedback. Uh, we will be touching, reaching out to you in, in the future to get uh, your thoughts as we address new challenges for the program and have to make important decisions on its trajectory, and we hope very much that you'll take advantage of the opportunity to share your thoughts with us. So with that, uh, thank you very much again for coming.